Welcome to Design Notes, the show in which we find out how the games you love get onto your table. In this week's show, I talk to the designer of Wingspan and Mariposas, Elizabeth Hargrave. We talk about playtesting and the phenomenon of Wingspan, among many other things. If you have any comments, please feel free to pop them in the box below, and I hope you enjoy the show. So, I am absolutely delighted and honoured to have Elizabeth Hargrave on the show. Elizabeth, welcome to the show and thank you for giving over your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, this is the first question I ask everybody and I always do a disclaimer when I start. Please don't feel that you have to be humble or anything. This is, this is an arena for you to brag. So, my first question is, when did you know that you were good at what you do? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I think there have been different gateways or, or like signposts along the way. So like winning the counterspiel was probably the biggest one. <laughs> I'm like, that's very validating. Um, but before then, even, I mean, getting to the point where you pitch a game and a publisher wants to publish it, like that is a big signpost that you're on the right track. And even before that, sort of in the playtesting process and feeling like I was always moving forward and when I play other people's games, I have useful things to tell them about how to make them better. Um, there's a lot of different pieces of feeling like yeah, I do kind of know what I'm doing. And and so back in the days when I could go to game groups, it, my heart would always sink a little bit when we were talking about what game to play and someone would come up and say, oh, well, I've got this prototype if you'd like to give it a go. And then I would grin and if I couldn't think up of a decent excuse, then I'd play it. I mean, how was the playtesting process for your first game for Wingspan? Were people really up for playtesting or was it like getting blood out of a stone? Well, I'm lucky here in the DC area because there are a lot of other designers and so there are regular playtesting events. So you don't have to necessarily um, spring your game on people who are expecting to play published games because it is a very different um, process and like you don't necessarily want people who aren't thinking critically about how the game is working to to play it I mean once it's at a certain point that's useful but early on it's super helpful to play test with other designers who sort of understand that every game starts out at a point where it's horrible and you're just trying to figure out like what what's the core of it what you know what are the pieces to really double down on and what can you let go of and and that those sorts of questions and so um yeah there's a group here that meets monthly in a local board game cafe there are a couple other sort of more private groups that i uh, have gotten hooked up with of just other designers um and you know as of a, a few years ago i started um, getting together with a friend of mine, Matthew O'Malley, who has other published games as well. Um, and we've been meeting weekly for years now. Um, and that's hugely helpful um, uh, structurally as well as just like to have um, other people who are sort of thinking about games in a, in a similar way to play with every week is, is huge. I mean, what was that process of getting people to play your prototypes like after Wingspan? Was was it was it easier? Was it different? Did you feel like people took you more seriously then, or or was it just the same? Um, it's mixed. I mean, any it's definitely like easy to get people to come to the table, um, but which I never had that much trouble before. Again, just because I'm so like grateful to the community of people who are willing to play test here in DC. But um but I, I do think it changes the dynamic somewhat and not necessarily in a good way in the sense that like people assume that I do know what I'm doing and then maybe are a little more wary of criticizing what's there. And so I have to like go out of my way to be like, 
this is a really rough draft. Everything's on the table. Like, you know, ignore the fact that Wingspan came out of the same brain. Like, <laughs> totally unrelated. Just, like, tell me what's wrong with it. Um, so it's, it's something I have to be aware of, I feel like. Um, but, yeah, it's it's definitely made it, it made people interested in seeing what I'm doing next. And, and you sort of touched on this already, but when I spoke to Matt Leacock, he said he wasn't really interested in what the play testers said to him. He was inter- He's interested in sitting back, watching the play testers, watching their reactions and gauging how they interact with the game and saying, oh, okay, they look bored there, they look excited there. How valuable is the feedback you, gave, you get from play testers? Are you, are you more sort of Matt Leacock play tester? I think I'm both. I definitely ask questions at the end of the playtest. I want to hear people hear what people say, but it's something that I really noticed when the pandemic started and I lost that in-person playtesting. Like, so people have shifted to doing stuff on Tabletop Simulator and Tabletopia, and I just hate it because I can't watch people's faces and their body language. Like, you, you and I realized that that is like 50% of my playtesting process is watching the people play. Um, so I've actually done very little playtesting of my own games in the last year because it's just, it doesn't feel as useful. Um, and I just am not a fan of those platforms in general. <laughs> like, I know lots of people find them like good enough to, to fill the gap in the pandemic, at least, if not like totally usable. But for me, they're just like, I think I also realized that part of my joy in playing games is the tactile, like moving this stuff around and, and having to do that with a mouse is just like horrifying to me in a way. But um, yeah, so I definitely do take a lot of the like body language and, and just like engagement and when do people look confused, even if they're not saying that they are kinds of kinds of feedback but I do also definitely like want to hear what they're saying I I try to listen for what's underneath what they're saying so if someone's saying you need to fix x I might probe and say are you saying that I need to fix that because you were frustrated with like what was the what what are you trying to fix by saying that I need to change that thing and and sort of go a couple levels deeper because my solution to the problem that they were having might not be the same one that they're suggesting, but the problem they were having is definitely worth knowing. About. So trying to to tease that out, I feel like is a is a useful conversation to have. You know, you were a gamer before you were a designer, and, and now you're a designer. How has that changed your relationship with playing? games are you more critical when you play them are you trying to pick out how they got to the destination they got to the biggest change is that it's kind of a zero-sum game right design time cuts into my time to play games play testing time Mm -hmm. definitely cuts into my time to play games um i'll definitely see things now and then and be like oh i can see why they did this little piece of the game. And actually one of the things that um, the guys that I normally play test with uh, weekly in person, we've been playing games online together, just publish games instead of play testing a lot during the pandemic. Um, and, and purposely trying to have those conversations of like, why is this game so popular? Why does it work? Like, what do we like and dislike? What would we do differently um, with this published game? So sometimes I go into it very intentionally doing that. If I'm just at a game night, I'm kind of able to turn most of that off and just enjoy the game. And you know, there's that old saying, to be a writer, be a reader. I mean, to what degree does that work for game designers? To be a designer, you need to be a player. To me, it's hugely important. Like, I want to... I feel like, for me, my taste in games was formed by having played a lot of games. And I feel like having a sense of taste and what works and what doesn't and what's fun, like, that comes from having played a lot of games. And then that gives me a good sense of when my game is done. Um, Because I know whether it can be better like whether it feels as good as the games that I love um so like in the sense of like do I feel like I need to stay on top of the latest greatest like what are the new innovations in in 
um, mechanics or whatever. Like I don't feel a huge obligation to do that. Although it's, you know, I'm curious. I'm a, like, I want to play all the games kind of person just generally. But um, f- in terms of being a good designer, I think it's important to get to the point where you understand your taste and what you like about games and have that gut check feeling of, of what is good which might be a different answer for different people. And it's, and it's important to get that personal sense of it, you know? And, and are you designing the kind of games that you like to play? In general, yes. Right? Like, there's a, there is a reason for a lot of the design decisions in Wingspan of, like, low conflict, tableau building. Like, those are all things that I enjoy. Engine building, for sure. Yeah. And so, you know... Can you give us uh, an overview of how you come from, you know, an idea that's in your head to a thing that's on a table that I'm playing that I'm I'm losing woefully at? How does that happen? Um, for me, there's often a specific thing in the world that I am fascinated by that I can sort of see a connection to have it would link to a game mechanic. Um, so for mariposas, it was, you know, the, the migration of the monarch butterflies and like that had a very clear link to me of like, oh yeah, they, you know, you could have them moving across the map. And that's like a very clear link between the thing in the world and how it would work in a game. Um, with Wingspan, it was sort of thinking about, I like all of these games with sort of economic engines and, and what would that look like in the natural world of like, oh, the resources would be the food that the animals are eating and that sort of mapping onto existing game mechanisms. Um, with Tussie Mussy, it was, I had just heard two different podcasts where two different designers were like, you know, what's underused is I split you choose mechanic. And that, that, so that led to thinking like, Okay, so if I'm giving things to people, I had been, I had recently heard about Victorian flower language. Okay, so I'm giving people flowers and that's the ice bowl you choose. So that sort of link between theme and mechanics is like the, the first jumping off point. Um, I often from that point will try to spend a, a few minutes thinking about like, okay, given that combination, like, how, what would my core audience be? How heavy would it be? Those sorts of questions and, and try to like come up with a really high level sort of vision statement about like what, it, what would this game be? And then I just start messing around with stuff and pull out some components, maybe make up some quickie cards, um, often handwritten, although now it's almost just as fast for me to do it on the computer and just print some stuff out. Um, and I'll play it against myself usually a bunch of times before I inflict it on anyone else. And then um, once it's ready in my mind to, to show to someone else, or if I feel like I just need to get a gut check from other people, I'll play it with my spouse or with my design group more and more often with the, the play testing folks that, that I play with a lot, just um, because my spouse is kind of burnt out on playtesting and doesn't have the same tolerance for like, the rules change every time I play this. <laughs> I can't take it. Um, so yeah, and then from there, it just becomes a very iterative process of play it with some people, get some feedback, try and make it better, bring it back to the table. Just iterate and iterate and iterate. And, and so... Has Wingspan enabled, has it made the process of getting game companies to look at your stuff easier? I I assume it must have, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I have companies that send me emails that are like, let us know if you have anything to pitch, which that never would have happened before, right? Um, Yeah. So, so, you know, within a a certain range of, of companies, I feel like. I could probably get a meeting with anyone I wanted to, which is very nice. Um, which is, you know, in stark contrast to when I first pitched Wingspan, having to, you know, send a whole bunch of emails just to get a few meetings, and then out of three meetings, having one publisher be interested in it. 
And I mean, how do you deal with rejection? Because I guess with Wingspan, as you said, there was there was a lot of rejection and one acceptance. Were you were you disheartened? Did you think I can't I can't be bothered with this, or were you always just determined I, I'm gonna get this game out there? You know, not long before I went through the pitching process with Wingspan, I actually listened to a talk by someone who wrote a book called Go for Now, which totally transformed the way. I think about it. So it, it, this is a concept that's very much around people who do a lot of marketing and like cold calling, right? Like you have to do a certain number of contacts to, to get to a yes. And so if you make your goal just putting yourself out there and, and having that number of meetings, then each time you get a no is still a success because you put yourself out there and, and, and did the meeting and then um, eventually that'll pay off. And for me, it's also like every meeting, even when the publishers rejected it, they had feedback for me. So, you know, and, and I, in a certain sense, play testing also sort of builds you up for that. Cause each, each play test, you're getting negative feedback on your game in general, right? And so you you have to build up enough of a skin to be like, okay, this is not negative. This is the information I need to make it better. So like criticism is good because it makes me better. Rejection is good because it means I was putting myself out there. Um, and eventually you get to yes. And so when I write stuff, so I have a book that I, I put notes down about things I want to write. And I've got notebooks and notebooks and notebooks and they're full of stuff that are that will only ever be a sentence. They will never they will never get to be somewhere else. What's yeah. the deal with you? What's your kind of ratio to ideas and workable prototypes? Oh yeah. I have a list on my phone that's stuff at the love at the high level of Here's an interesting thing in the world that might match up to a, a mechanic sometimes. I haven't even like really thought through the mechanic, but like this seems like it could be a game. That's probably like a hundred items long, right? Like I could spend the rest of my life working through those hundred and probably not even make it through all of them. Um, there's a much, much shorter list of things that I've actually started working on. There's only one game that I've just like completely shelved after having made a prototype. And I still might come back to it again. Um, Mark Poses was definitely in that camp of like, I shelved it. And then I had a lot of stuff to do on Wingspan. And Mark Poses hadn't been working, focused really hard on Wingspan. By the time I turned back to Mark Poses, it had sort of gelled in the back of my brain and, and came together really quickly. Um, there's another game that I'm working on right now that's kind of in that same boat of like, I made a rough prototype a long time ago i'm coming back to the concept now and all of a sudden like i have all these new ideas about how it should work um so that process of like at least writing it down getting something rough out and i might or might not come back to it but when i do come back to it often i see a way forward um that's been nice to discover. <laughs> and so how has your process changed since you've gone from being an amateur game designer to a professional game designer? Do you do you think that your your processes have have changed or improved? Um that's a good question. I mean, over, I don't know if it's as a consequence of like professionalizing, but certainly over time one thing that has changed has been that I try to spend less time on my prototypes in the sense of like, they really don't have to look good. In fact, there's a designer um, named Daniel Solis who I heard talk about. He, so he's a graphic designer as his day job and then board game designer on the side. And um, he talks about like, you don't want your prototype to look better than the stage that it's at gameplay wise, because it gives players the wrong sense of what type of feedback you're looking for. So if you put something that's really rough looking on the table, they'll know that it's a very early draft and they'll feel totally open to giving you all kinds of feedback and assuming that nothing is fixed. 
Whereas if you have put in a lot of placeholder art and like all the fonts are fancy and whatnot, then that might give people an impression that you're like about to go to Kickstarter and you're just looking for little small broken things. Um, so that's been something that's helpful for me to keep in mind because my natural inclination is to make things pretty. Like I'm a very artsy craftsy person, but it's, it's a lot of time and it's, it's all going to change. So like, that's just wasted time. And so on that, on sort of graphic design and art, because, you know, the one thing people say about, well, lots of things about Wingspan, but one of the things they say is just how arresting it is to look at. Mariposas, I think, I think is, is beautiful too. What input do you have in that part of the process? or And is it different between publishers? Um, it's similar between publishers in that they generally have asked me, like, is there something you want to work with? Um, and then have, like, gone off and, and talked to those people. Um, and then, you know, if they were available. like So in the case of Mariposas... I had a conversation with the art director at AEG and we were sort of brainstorming because there have been a bunch of butterfly games, right? And some of them have a very similar aesthetic. So we were like, okay, what can we do that's different from those games? Um, and we were like, okay, let's like double down on the fact that the butterflies are going to Mexico. So we found an artist from Mexico. We used those bright colors that you see on the ofrendas at the Day of the Dead. Um, and just really tried to like make that part of the theme. Um, so yeah, that was like a brainstorming conversation that we had. I went and like found a bunch of artists from Mexico that I liked the look of their art just to give him ideas. He ended up picking one of them. Um, uh, but other than that sort of brainstorming process, it was all on the publisher. Um, with Wingspan, yeah, with Wingspan, they, they like found the artists, showed me some of their work. I was like, great, let's go. And then I had a little bit of conversation back and forth with the artists about like the reference points for the birds, actually. Like what kind of poses did I want and things like that. And then they ran with it. So, yeah. So it's undeniable that Wingspan has been a phenomenon. And I I had Jamie on my show and I asked him this question. I'd be really interested to get your perspective on it. What is the lightning in the bottle that was caught with Wingspan? Why is it being the phenomenon that it is, do you think? I think part of it is that people connect with the theme more than anyone expected. Um, I think part of it is the way that the engine building works that it's got multiple layers that are building the engine at once. So like just by the fact of getting a card out on your board, you're moving up on that track that's making you better at doing things. And then you get to activate the birds, which are also making you better at doing things. Um, so there's like, <laughs> there's a podcast called Cognitive Gamer. That's like a cognitive psychologist that talks about how games work. And he was like, that is like every time you're activating those birds, that's a dopamine hit, right? Like it's just so satisfying to run your engine. Um, so I think that's part of it, but there are lots of engine builders that have someone, I don't, so I don't know. It's, it's the theme. It's, it's fun engine building. It's beautiful art. I mean, if I knew I would just do it over and over again, but it's, I, who, I don't know. <laughs> Do you have any theories? <laughs> so, so we were. Well, I was speaking to Jamie, and and Jamie does this thing that I don't know whether he does this in real life, but he does this in interviews where you ask him a question, and then he turns it back on you and says, "So, what do you think about that?" And my my answer was that I think Wingspan is to a large degree the board game equivalent of a coffee table book, right? Yeah, it it feels yeah. like a lifestyle object as much as a game. Right, it's something you'd be happy to have on your coffee table and people to look at because it's so arresting, right? Yeah, and that I can take zero credit for, except for the concept that this would be a thing that would be pretty to look at. Like that was definitely part of my initial vision of it, but I can't take any credit for the great art, right? <laughs> and so you know, you've had so far, as far as I know, three games published. Yeah. Um. 
and I I would love I I've got ideas percolating around my head for for game design ideas themes more than designs because my brain doesn't work that way but how does it feel when you know you get that ring on the bell and you open the door and your your designer copies have arrived how does it feel holding that box with the real art and your name on it is it is it magical it's pretty magical. Yeah, it's pretty great. With Wingspan, Jamie actually was kind enough to Skype with me when he got the first proof from the manufacturer. He was like, look, this is your thing. And But then, yeah. And and actually, because he his process is, he's like so secretive, right, until he announces it. So I got my box of Wingspan copies in October or November, I want to say, and then it wasn't released until January. So I had this magical, amazing thing that I wasn't allowed to show anybody. That was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the future, you you sort of mentioned that you're working on something. Is What do you have? What can we expect from Elizabeth Hargrave in the future? Yeah, so the very next thing is that there's a little expansion coming up for Tussie Mussie which is my 18 card game about the, the giving people of Victorian flowers. Um, so that'll be at the end of May, I think the 25th. Um, and then I have a game signed with Pandasaurus that will be out next year. I'm working on the next Wingspan expansion. And I am just starting on another game that is about mushrooms. We'll see if it ever actually sees the light of day. It's like just starting a prototype. So we'll see. And so what niche do you feel like you fill within the world of games? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I definitely just personally naturally gravitate to games that are about real things things in the world um and mostly naturey stuff um so that maybe is a bit of a niche um and i think i'll continue to mostly do sort of midweight euro you know low definitely low conflict um that sort of niche as well i don't know that's sort of just my personal style. I don't know if it's a niche. <laughs> so I've got, I've got two more questions then. So conventions are back on and you've been working hard at the convention and you go to a restaurant in the evening and you're walking past a booth and you hear a table of gamers and you hear your name pop up. So you sidle into a corner and you eavesdrop. What do you hope they're saying about you? Oh my gosh. I don't know. Um, that they've had a lot of fun playing my games. And uh, I mean, I do hope also over time that I hope that some of my games have inspired more people to get into designing games um, who thought that industry wasn't welcoming to women, for example, um, which now I have kind of blown that open. <laughs> I learned a, a few weeks ago that Mary Flanagan at one point had a publisher recommend to her that she use a male pseudonym because they thought a game by a woman wouldn't sell. Um, so I think I've blown that notion open. So I hope that'll be sort of part of my legacy. I don't know that I need people to talk about it, but... <laughs> <laughs> to the extent that that's like what your question's getting at, I, I do hope that'll be part of it too. I mean, do you think you're inspirational? Do you think your games inspire people to go on and make their own? I think Wingspan changed people's mental image of what is publishable and what will do well as a game. I don't know if I'm insp I mean, I've had people say that they started designing after they saw me as a designer, but I, I don't know how significant that it, like I am as an inspiration, but I think I've 
shown that um, the the range of what can be successful is broader than some publishers may have thought it was. So I said I was going to ask you two questions, but it's now turned into three. But this is the last question, I promise. That's okay, I'll uh, talk to you. Why, <laughs> <laughs> why is gaming good? <clears throat> I think, in general, gaming brings people together. If you're talking about board gaming, it brings people together without the mediation of screen, right? right? Like you're physically mm-hmm. sitting together around the table. Um, for me, I enjoy like the puzzly thinky part of games as much as I do the social part of them. Uh, and they have, you know, other aspects of them too. Like the tactile nature we were talking about earlier, I think is very satisfying to people. There's just, there's a, a lot of different things going on when you're playing games that satisfy different people with with different things that they care about and um and so you can have you know someone who's a really social person and someone who's a really tactile person but they play a game together and like they each get something out of it and that's really special there's a, not a lot of of um experiences like that and and that are so engaging like we participate together in other forms of entertainment but they're mostly passive watching or listening and and with Mm -hmm. games you're like hands-on um and directly interacting with other people while you're experiencing the entertainment and that's special fabulous well elizabeth hargrave thank you very much thanks ben